You are listening to Living the Clover Life. Welcome back to season three, where we are so excited to talk about coming alive in your faith. That's a big question, coming alive. But we're going to cover all the aspects of that from the Holy Spirit, how he empowers us to come alive, Pentecost, and everything that that means in our faith and how Christ wants to live in us. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Spirit upon us into our minds, into our hearts. Help us to come alive in you, that our faith may be meaningful, that it may always be a part of who we are and how we live in the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's easy, especially if we've had, you know, tough, which all of us have to, to some degree or another, tough relationships with our earthly father, to know what it means to really have a good father and not to have to earn that love. Very often society tends to encourage this way of thinking where, you know, you have to do this in order to have this, in order mm-hmm. to be lovable, to be valuable. And at the beginning, we had complete and utter relationship with God that was so beautiful and, and, and so intimate. And then what does Satan do? He comes along and says, well, you know, you don't <laughs> actually have that. You, you think you do, but you don't. If God really loved you, you know, he would let you eat any of from any of these trees. And so, you know, Satan from the beginning has undermined our identity. He says, you know, oh, if you want to be like God, you have to, to eat from this tree. Whereas, of course, we know from the beginning, God made us to be like him. We are made in his image and likeness. And as a result of that, we're confused down through the generations as to what it means to be alive in him. And so tend to live life caught up in in worry about are we enough? Are we doing enough? Are we able to to have that value that we all desire to have? And so we have that principle upside down, that, that paradigm upside down. Right. Doing having being. So we think that we have to do something to maybe earn love, to earn earn some kind of honor, earn something, and then we'll have an identity. But it's really the opposite, that right. God gives us an identity, which gives us access to everything that he possesses, that he owns. And then we can act and move from that place of freedom, from that place of, of being, uh, that that helps us to live in the world so freely and so wonderfully as Christ. It's easy for us to kind of have that idea in our head, right? Like, oh yeah, God loves me. I know that. That's 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 the right answer. Kind of like what you were saying earlier. That idea is so is so ingrained in us that yeah, okay, it's there, kind of in the background. But does it really affect our heart? When I'm when I'm talking about this this topic for me, the image that I always find helpful is you know you have to get this truth of God's love and of our value and of our calling from our head to our heart to our feet. Mm. And sometimes the distance between your head and your heart is the longest distance. And sometimes <laughs> it's the distance between your heart and your feet in terms of where you are in your life. So, you know, it, we have to understand it. We have to accept it relationally. And then we have to live like that matter to walk the walk that shows that we're actually responding to that. So let's come back to the beginning. So of course, through the fall, as we've talked about before, we lost the sense of identity, which which gives us what we have from the Father and, and how we live in the world. And Adam and Eve, they, they took so that they could have and, and corrupted their identity in so many ways. And so Christ comes into the world to set that straight, that we might have life and really have it to the fullest, to heal us, to heal those wounds of hurt identities and reestablish our true identity as beloved sons and daughters of the Father and to pour out the Holy Spirit into our lives. When you just said it right there, right? Adam and Eve, we talk about Adam as being the old man, right? And Christ is the new Adam. So mm-hmm. he reconciles, he he clarifies, he he purifies what humanity was meant to be once again. He reclaims that identity for us because in some ways when Adam and Eve fell, all of humanity, the whole line, if you will, the whole bloodline of humanity was tainted by that, the accusation that Satan was able to bring against them that, look, you've fallen, you're, you're not good. So that judgment, that demand of, of, uh, of punishment that Satan desired for us and then was quick to turn the corner and, and accuse us of, and, and Christ by his 
coming, by his death, by his resurrection, by his ascension and his sending down the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, he calls us to the new life again, once again, of what we were meant to be from the beginning. And that happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. What happened at the beginning of time? What brought life into the world? It was the spirit of, of, of the Father, right? The spirit of God on the face of the deep. And then what happens in Mary in her womb, right? In, in the waters of her womb, as it were, right? It's the Holy Spirit coming and bringing life there. And not just any life, the life of Christ. And that is how we too incarnate Christ. That's how we welcome Christ to live in us, is by accepting and living in the life of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Where we really kind of get it wrong or, or we go wrong is we begin to believe that God's holding us back. Yeah. You know, we, we begin to believe that somehow, and that's how Satan really tricked Adam and Eve in the beginning was God's not going to give you everything that's going to fulfill your desires. God's not going to, to give you access to everything in heaven, everything that you need. And so you need to take for yourself or you need to earn something. Right and do something to, to get that. And that's what we, we want to talk about in this season. It's almost like Satan accuses the father of being a con man, right? Mm. Or, or, or a false advertiser, right? right? Like you say, it's going to be so great. And you say, if I, if I use this shampoo, my hair is going to be, <laughs> although you know for me, father, a champ, yeah, no shampoo is going to help. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, but if you look at, at how we kind of respond to, to God, it's, it's with this, like, uh, I don't know if I can really trust him, you know, like he says he's good. He says all these things, but man, there's some tough things in my life that, that make me think mm, maybe that's not so. And that's another lie that Satan consistently tries to breed in our life. Like, you know, if God was really good, he wouldn't have let that happen to you. If God really cared, if his spirit was really within you, I, you know, these things wouldn't have happened, whatever it is. So let's talk a little bit about them. What holds us back from coming fully alive in Christ. Right, because there should be no reason as to as to why we don't have fullness of life, right? We fully believe that we have the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of, of the Eucharist, the sacrament of reconciliation, these things that pour out grace into our life. You know, why, why isn't that grace lived out loud? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about the reality that even though we receive grace and that grace is absolutely real, that grace can remain bound. It's almost like a present, right? Like if I gave you a present and it was wrapped and you never unwrapped it, you'd never know what was inside. Like let's say it was a toy, you could never play with that toy. And so too, our identity, our call to this newness of life is held back when we don't seek to open up that that grace and that grace uh, of that opening up of that grace happens by the fire of the Holy Spirit coming mm -hmm. down upon us. And and I like that image of the the wrapped gift that is not tapped into because I think that highlights for me what going through the motions in my life can be like. Right. I, I'm, I have the sacrament. I have the gift there. I'm going to mass. I, I'm doing the right things at mass. I'm coming and going each week with it. But somehow I know there's more. Right. And, and I, I can't get at it. And I, I'm trying to figure out why. why. Why can't I get to the gift? Of course, that's what we want to really get into in this, this season is opening the gift takes that power of the Holy Spirit, which helps us to continually come alive. Now, what gets in the way a lot of the times are, are two extreme settings. Right. I would say sin and woundedness right. Right. on one end, where I have maybe had something happen to me that has really hurt me, that's hurt my relationship with God, uh, that I projected maybe on that, given the, the devil a, a foothold to come into my life. Right. Maybe it is uh, sin in my life or habits of sin that, that prevent me from tapping into the gift that God wants to which, give me. Which so often comes out of our woundedness, right? All, mm -hmm. all sin stems from us trying to, to gain what we feel like we're lacking. We protect ourselves by building up walls. And right. those walls can be against God. They can be against other people. They can be about just understanding myself. I build up a wall to myself. That sounds kind of funny, but mm -hmm. but, yeah. but it can happen. I've seen it happen in, in our lives before. Well, when, our, when we think about our truest self being made in the image and likeness of God, we are good, right? At our core, mm -hmm. we are good. We're we're broken to some degree, right? Satan has has worked his his will in us all too often in, in our concupiscence of original sin, but Christ seeks to heal that and, and draw back out the true fullness and goodness of who we are, which is actually who we are 
deep down. But that woundedness so often leads to us having a pattern of sin, which leaves us dead, right? Like a constant death in our life, as opposed to the life that Christ wants to give to us. And so being able to break down those walls to, to meet the scary areas of our life with the Holy mm. Spirit, yeah. with God, to invite God into those areas, to heal them. That's hard. A lot of people resist that or, or try to sidestep it or ignore it. And we want to talk about how do you, you dive into that later? So often we we have a faith of low expectations, mm. right? We, we settle for yeah. religiosity, right? This idea that religion is just this thing that I do. It's a good thing, right? It's what grandma taught me to do. It's what we, you know, we as a family have always done. We're always have we we've always been Catholic, we're always gonna be Catholic. But you know, does it really affect the way that I live? Do I actually believe the Bible more than I believe my own experience, right? Do I believe that God is good regardless? Or do I say, well, God wasn't so good today? Or, you know, let's be practical, let's be real. We can't really trust God. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that we should, you know, sit at home. Uh, and starve ourselves saying, God will feed me, right? That doesn't mean there's not a, a partnership with there, but that's really what it comes down to is that it, it's a relationship. It's not just a, a, a mechanism that you use. God's not the almighty vending machine. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it's not that kind of relationship. God is a person. God is persons. I almost said he was <laughs> a person. He's persons, <laughs> three of them. And you can have a relationship with each of those persons. And that's how we, we come alive. But you, you know, you look at what Jesus said about religiosity. And let me clarify, when I say religiosity, I don't mean being religious. Being religious is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you hear our, our culture, we talk about this idea, of, well, I'm spiritual, not religious. Right. Well, the problem with that is people fail to understand what the word religion or religious means. When you go back to its roots, it actually means to to connect again, or to or literally re uh, ligatus uh, to ligament again to connect. And what what do ligaments do? Yeah, they they connect your bones to your muscles, and they, and they they make a human being able to move and be alive. Right? We know one of the one of the signs of of life is is motion. And so when Jesus talks about this idea of religiosity, who's he usually talking about? The Pharisees. The Pharisees, which is interesting because. Jesus himself was a, a Pharisee in the sense that he believed in the resurrection from the dead and so on, but he, he didn't follow the, the sort of fake way of life that they were living. And I love that that image that he uses. He calls them whitewashed tombs, yeah, right? Yeah. This idea of like, oh, it looks nice on the outside, but what is in, what's inside a tomb? A dead person. A dead person, right? <laughs> it's death. And so often we can come to mass and we can put on a good show and we can live a, a, face, a Facebook Catholicism. Right. And so this is the exact opposite of what we want to do. We, we really want to be coming alive in our faith so that we're not that dead person in the tomb, but that everything animates. And, right. and that is certainly by the power of the Holy Spirit. One other thing that gets in the way of the power of the Holy Spirit is sometimes unforgiveness. Yeah. And the way that we can hold on to past hurts. There's a lot of misconceptions about what it means to forgive someone that I got to act like it didn't mean anything. That's not what forgiveness is about. It's it's not about saying nothing happened or right. being a doormat or opening myself up to be hurt again. Maybe we do have to set boundaries. It's releasing yourself from the toxicity of anger and hate and bitterness uh, that this wound has caused us in our life. I don't know if you've heard the phrase, but you know, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and, and hoping the other person gets hurt. Right. right. And and that's that speaking of poison death, right? That that's what keeps us dead inside is this inability to allow life to come because we're so caught up in the, the fear that because we've been wounded before, we might be wounded again. And but as you pointed out, we don't have to 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 say Oh, it didn't matter. Oh, I'm going to put myself back in this abusive relationship or, or put myself in a situation where it's unsafe for me again. But it does mean that we release the the debt that they owe us, yes. right? It's an acknowledgement that yes, this hurt. Yes, this was a problem. I was. It's I was something wronged. we pray in the Lord's Prayer, right? Every time, right? Every time we say that prayer, forgive us our trespasses, our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us who are indebted to us. Yeah. Well, we talk a lot about, you know, coming alive. What does that mean? You know, we, we've talked about how we have this idea of Christ's plan for us in, in so many ways from the beginning of time. We talk about our, our, our fall and, and the ways that we can live out 
a lack of life, but what does it mean for us to be fully alive? Well, to be fully alive is to be Christ, right? And so really every Christian, what should you look like? You should look like Christ yeah. in the world. That's what the normal Christian looks like is Jesus. You, me, everyone listening to us, that's who you are. That's your identity. You are meant to be Jesus in the world. I'm going to repeat that one more time because I think that can just sometimes go over our head as like, oh yeah, that sounds nice. That's supposed to be a thing. But no, the normal Christian is supposed to look, to walk, to talk, to live, to, 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 to pray, to work miracles, to live the life, to, to sacrifice oneself as Jesus did. And that's amazing. Right. And that's why you have to constantly be asking what did Jesus do? Yeah. yeah. How, when I read the Gospels, what do I see Jesus doing? That's a call to me to preach, to perform signs and wonders, to heal, to cast out demons, to do the will of the Father, to speak the Father's love into people's lives. Those are huge things. And sometimes you think, whoa, 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 Father, I can't do that. I'm just an uh, average Joe Catholic out here. I'm a disciple. I'm not even Peter and James and John. You're saying I need to do all those things? Yeah, and and so often we say, well, I'm, but I'm not a saint. What we kind of usually mean by that is I'm not perfect. Mm. Uh, first of all, we, you are a, a small S saint. You're not a canonized saint yet, but you are a saint by your baptism. You're, you're one of the holy ones. When we become baptized, we get caught up into the fullness of the life of the Trinity. And it's not that we first loved God, but that he first loved us. You know, you have to remember that Jesus is looking at the Father and saying, well, what is the Father doing? What, what's, what does the Father want done? Okay, I'm going to do that. Not because of, of who he is in his divinity, but because of who he is in, in his humanity, which is really kind of a, a refined theological point, but it's really essential for us to understand. It's easy to think, okay, well, Jesus can do all of these things because he's a divine person. Right, he's God. I'm yeah. not God. But what happens the central event that, that we share with Jesus is the baptism, right? That Jesus goes and he's baptized in the Jordan and we see the Holy Spirit descend upon him. First, we see the heavens open and yeah. they never close, right? They remain open. So access to heaven is made open to Christ and to all Christians. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit comes upon him and it's almost as though Jesus is basically saying, I'm going to defeat the devil with my humanity, with the hook of, with the hook of my humanity. We pray in the, in one of the prayers of the Easter vigil mm. and because it's so insulting, the devil hates us. He hates God for making us. Uh, he just really does not like human beings. And so for God to become man was so awful for the devil. Right. And so for God to defeat him by, his humanity means something very much. And so the Holy Spirit comes upon him and Jesus basically kind of decides, I'm going to just fight one handed. Right. I'm going to use my <laughs> humanity, not my divinity, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, I am going to do all of these things because that's how I'm going to invite my disciples right. afterwards to follow me they, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are going to do the same things that I did through my humanity, not by the power of my divinity as the second person of the Trinity, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon my humanity and was united through baptism, which they're going to experience. When you say, well, how do we know that? Like, like, come on, maybe he cheated sometimes. You know, <laughs> maybe he used a little bit of his divinity here and there, you know. First of all, we know that God is completely good and he's completely humble and he humbled himself to, to become man so that he could show us how to live. But in scripture, we even see this in Philippians too. It talks about how he doesn't see uh, equality with God as something to be grasped at. He empties himself of his divinity, right? The word in Greek is kenosis. It's like this complete pouring out. So like you say, he ties his divinity behind his back. You know, think of a, of a fighter in a ring, mm -hmm. right? Tying his, his dominant hand behind his back and just showing how strong he is and how strong that, that other part of him is, that's how Christ wants us to see him so that we can know that we don't have to be the exact person of Jesus Christ in the sense that, that we, we are God, but we can connect to and we can tap into the love of God and into the power of God through the Holy Spirit, which I think you kind of mentioned when you, when you talk about heaven opening up, right? When heaven opens above him, when heaven opens above us as Christians when we're baptized, 
think of it as like a cupboard opening in the kitchen where all the good stuff is, right? We can reach up and we can pull down the graces of heaven. That's what prayer is. Prayer isn't begging God like like God is somehow a, a miser who would only give something if you really debase yourself. You know, God's a generous father who wants to give and it's all there in the cupboard. And all we have to do is just reach up and, and, and pull it down, which is just such a beautiful uh, relational way of understanding God. And it's, it's really the, the, the best and truest way of understanding our loving father. Yeah. So there's always more. And that's really the key as we, we finish this episode here is that there is always more. This is a, about a process of conversion. That's, that's really what's central to being Catholic is there's always more. We're always in the process of conversion in our life. Right. We're, we're staying fascinated with Jesus because we, we want to become more like him. And that's kind of what this whole series is about is, is coming alive in the Holy Spirit so we can be Christ in the world. There's a beautiful quote from Pope Benedict XVI. And he talks about how a dogmatic faith unsupported by personal experience remains empty, and yet a personal experience unrelated to the faith of the church remains blind. So we have to understand doctrine as Catholics. We have to, to know our faith, right? But we also have to have that personal encounter with Christ, and that's what animates our life as church. That's what makes us who we are, because you know, church is not just something we do. It's who we are. <laughs> Beautifully said. So this has been a great intro to what this season is going to be all about. We hope you continue to join us for this Coming Alive series. Join us next week as we talk about the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. Until then, keep living the Clover life. You've been listening to Living the Clover Life. For more information about St. Malachi Catholic Parish, check out our website at stmalachy.org. S-T-M-A-L-A-C-H-Y dot org.